you might be thinking, you know, Pastor Bruce, you're just making us feel guilty. You're trying to make us feel like we're all just self-centered, egotistical, driven people. Is that what you're trying to do? No, I'm just trying to reflect what Paul is saying to Timothy here. Let me give you three guidelines to think about as you look at your own life and your own church with this issue of self-centeredness. Let me give you three words. The first word is this, creed. The word creed in the English language means the substance of what we believe. We say over and over again in this class and in the previous class, belief drives behavior. Not the other way around. Behavior doesn't drive belief. Belief drives or determines behavior. A creed is a a system of what we believe, what we believe about God, what we believe about other people, what we believe about ourselves, that we believe that the words of this book are truly God's word. There's a major attack going on in the Western world these days that tries to determine, is this really God's word, all of it? There's a huge debate going on in the Western world of, can we trust that this is really God's word? I would say to you, of the very few things that I would die for, I would die for the truth that this is all God's word. I was in a conversation several years ago with another pastor of, uh, in the town in which I serve, and there was a debate going on in, in our culture about whether God's word is really all God's word. And so we got into talking about this, and, and I said, so what do you believe about God's word? Do you believe that it's the, it's, the Bible is all God's word? And I expected him to say yes, and he said, well, no. And I was so shocked. I thought to myself, and I, I didn't want to say anything to offend him, but I thought to myself, well, which parts are God's word? When you start to decide some are and some are not God's word, who's the determiner of what's in and what's out? Me or him or a church or a denomination. Friend, I accept that everything we have in these pages is God's inerrant word. It was given in the original languages. It was copied. And what we find evidence of in English or in Russian or in, in whatever particular language it's translated, in, we say that the original uh, pieces of Scripture which were written are completely God's Word. We have so many copies of those original pieces, manuscripts, copies, and the variation between them is so small. You have every reason to believe that what's in this book is truly God's Word. It is what God intended for us to have, all 66 books. If I'm worried about being self-centeredness, then I must become a man or a woman of this book. That we obey the words of God. It shows me who I am, it shows who God is, and we follow the words of this book. Second, the second word would be character. Character, my identity, who I am. This is another part of the belief drives behavior. If my belief system is intact, then my life is based on those things that I begin to have a God-honoring character that is not first and foremost self-centered. I have to look at my life. I have to look at the things that I say. I have to look at the things that I teach. When I was talking to my congregation at one point, I said, when you listen to my messages, if you ever hear anything that is wrong or inaccurate, you need to come and tell me. And if I'm not willing to listen to that and I'm wrong, then you need to talk to our leaders and I need to be rebuked. That, 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 that sense of the holiness of God's word involved in and in, in changing our character is so very important. That's part of my fear in teaching this class. Lord, what if I teach something wrong? I'm not trying to. I want to teach accurately. Does my character is that reflected in the words that you're trying to share with these other people? So character is a very important quality if I'm trying to stay away from self-centeredness. Third one, the third word I would give you is converts. Converts. When someone converts to Jesus Christ, what change is taking place? When you look at the followers of Paul or Timothy, or you look at the followers of Jesus Christ, does their life reflect a change? One of the things that's happening in America, and, and I'm sorry to use so many examples about the Western world, there are many good things happening. So 
when I say some of the negative things about our culture, I don't want you to think that everything is horrible. But they become examples for you that hopefully you can avoid in your churches. But one of the things that's happening is we end up um, saying that we believe in Jesus Christ, but our life reflects very little change. Very hard to measure. In fact, what's happening is you could find a variety of teachers on the internet or on the television or downloaded in your iPod or in, in podcasts and say, well, I like this teacher or I like this teacher. I don't really like my local church. But no matter whom a person says that they'll follow, they say, you know what? You can tell a lot about what a person believes by the teaching that they listen to. Is their life showing a transformed life? This, this section of verses, I think, comes with a sense of urgency. I think Paul is giving Timothy a very clear warning that was as true then as it is today. That today, as the return of Jesus Christ gets closer, we need to be people of this book who live and breathe the words of this book in a devotional way, in a deep way, in an all-encompassing life kind of way. That we understand how great he is and how awesome he is and how that helps us live this particular life. And I didn't read the last phrase of verse 5. What happens when people in our church continue to be self-centered like the way he describes it here? Look at his words. Avoid such people. And say, what? They're saying that they're brothers and sisters in Christ. You want me to avoid them? Stay away from them. For example, when our, when our children are growing up, or when you were teenagers, or when you're in university, the people that we hang around with, the people that we spend time with, they're going to affect some of the paths that we take. If the friends that we develop in high school or university are good and godly, that's going to help us follow a good and godly path. But if we get into those high school years and the friends we choose and the friends that we have take us away, influence us in a way to take us away from the truth of God's word, that's unhealthy. Paul says, listen, if there are people in your church who are unhealthy and refuse to come under the, the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ, he says, don't hang out with them. You need to avoid them because they're going to steer you away from a life centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's always about the gospel. It's always about the gospel. That's what drove Paul to do everything he did. And we must avoid as much as possible the self-centeredness of the life in which we can live. Let me give you an example as we draw it to a close. I told you that I love to play the game of basketball. I don't think I told you that I've actually coached basketball for a number of years. I've coached our boys in, in some small youth leagues, but before I got married, I actually had a chance to coach a ninth grade basketball team in my hometown. Our particular school had a lot of boys, and so the, the varsity coach said, Bruce, would you like to coach a group of boys? I don't have time for them, but we're going to start a, a third team. And I said, I think I'd enjoy that. Well, this particular year, I was blessed with nine players, most of which had a lot of talent. And I'm going, we're going to do great. We're going to win all of our games. I'm going to be coach of the year. This is going to be phenomenal. This is going to be fun. But the fact that they were talented didn't mean that we were a good team. The first couple games that we played were just terrible. We had worked in our practices on defense. We had worked on certain offenses. You move here, he moves there, he goes there. You pass here, you set a pick here, and you go to the basket and score. They wouldn't run the play. I remember, I can still remember to this day, I can picture it in my mind. We were in another school playing a basketball game. And my boys, who I had tried to train, were going every which direction. They weren't doing the things that I had asked them. They were just doing their own thing. I remember sitting in my chair as a coach, and I was thinking this. I said, I'm just going to let them play. They can do whatever they want. They are self-centered. They're going to lose. I'll just let them go. And then something inside of me said, no, you can't do that. You're their coach. I called them in and I said, boys, something is going to change. 
you need to do this or we are not going to be a team. They didn't change that day, but the change began that day. By the end of that year, our team was so tightly knit. We had so much fun. We won a lot of games. We got on a winning streak that by the end, we had only lost one or two games the rest of the year because these guys had abandoned their self-centeredness and began to live as a team. How I've told you time and time again, the Christian life was never intended to be lived alone. That we work in harmony and unity with others. And that means that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and that we live in relationship with other people who can help us on this journey, journey away from self-centeredness and away toward Christ-centeredness. Our churches can be places of safety. Our churches can be places of harmony. Our churches can be places of integrity. Our churches can be places where the Word of God is taught and lived and obeyed and applied. The Church of Jesus Christ is still the tool that God is using to reach the world today. He has not abandoned it. It is His, it is his missionary, as it were, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is His instrument that He is using to reach the world. And what Paul would say to Timothy, Timothy, be aware in these last days, this is what's going to happen in the church, but be ready. The church does not have to give in to the self-centered nature of the fleshly desires that still wage war on us. Keep going, Timothy. Instruct them. Teach them. And what, watch what God does when he glorifies himself through his church. That brings us to the end of this section, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. When we pick up our story in our next lesson with verse 6 and following, we're going to see some more of the particular problems that were happening in that church and to prepare for that and to be instructed by it. But that'll be in our next lesson. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift 